Hi there, I'm Drew Badger, the world's number one English fluency guide, and it is a pleasure to welcome you to another video. Thank you for joining me in the studio today. This is probably the most important video I've ever made, and I hope it really makes a lot of sense for you and answers a lot of questions. Uh, this video actually is a response to a teacher who had written me and asked me about how to help students learn, especially non-native children, and I spent a lot of time doing this. Uh, I've been teaching uh, over 15 years now, helping people learn. Uh, so this teacher was asking me, her name is Iman. Um, hopefully I'm pronouncing that properly, uh, but she was asking again specifically, what can I do to teach uh, non-native English speaking children English and help them learn so they actually want to speak? Um, so we're going to talk about that, but just a bit of a background about this as well. Um, even before that, so I've been helping people learn, as I said, for a long time. And the way I teach, uh, I never really had a good name for it until recently. And it's kind of something else, like in a similar way uh, that what I do, I kind of develop this idea of being an English fluency guide because I'm not here to try to teach you the language. It's more uh, making the language understandable so that people want to practice, want to speak, uh, and so I'm more of a guide for fluency as opposed to teaching the language. And I'll, I'll make that point more clear about this. But I was really excited. So lately I've been talking about this idea with uh, my newsletter subscribers. And I thought I'd make a video about it uh, to answer I Iman's question. But also just to help a lot of other learners too. Because I know a lot of people are interested in this. Anyway. Uh, basically, the idea is we're going we're gonna to cover a whole bunch of things in this video, uh, but the most important one is the problem that people experience. Uh, so part of this is what Iman was talking about, about how to help actually people learn uh, the English language, or really this is a video for any language if you're a teacher of any language, uh, and I'll explain why as we go through the video. But also it's a problem for people who have already been learning the language. So many of the people watching this will likely be students of mine. Uh, maybe they've been learning the language for many years. Now they are adults and they understand. They know a lot of words and grammar, but they have trouble expressing themselves. They can't actually put everything together in conversations. So basically, there are actually a lot of different problems people have. Uh, and I'm going to tell you that they all come from the same place in this video. So you know, kind of general problems people have, like you know, maybe you uh, are a learner and you struggle with some of these. Uh, maybe you forget your words when you speak, like inside of a, a speaking conversation uh, or you know, some other situation where you have to communicate. Uh, you forget the words that you want to say or you have to think about grammar rules and translate in your head before you speak. Or you really have trouble understanding native speakers in conversations or movies and TV shows, but you can understand what I'm saying quite well. So I'm going to explain basically why this happens, all these problems that people have as learners and what we start doing for when we're helping young children learn the language too, we basically all do the same thing, which is teach them what I call the wrong way. Uh, and this is because uh, of something I call the great language learning lie. Now, if you've not heard about this, this is just an idea that I've been thinking about for a while. And again, it's taking me a long time, actually many years to think about a great way to express this to make it really obvious for people and very clear what the problems are. The reason that so many people have trouble being able to understand people or have trouble expressing themselves in conversations. So what I call the great language learning lie is really the idea that there's such a thing as a second language. Now, I know this sounds kind of weird uh, and you might listen to that and, whoa, that sounds like a kind of controversial thing. Isn't it obvious that there are many different you know, languages and so you would learn something like your native language. That's what you speak at home with your parents and then when you go to school or if you go to a different country or something, you would speak what's called a second language. Now. As far as I'm concerned, when I'm thinking about learning a second language or I'm trying to help other people learn a second language, I want them to understand that there really is no such thing as a second language. Uh, and I'll explain why in a little bit. But first, let's just talk about the problems of having this belief. So this belief that there is such a thing as a second language. And because there is such a thing as a second language, you need to teach the way that there is such a thing as a second language. So just to make sure this is not confusing, um, really the problem is that teachers in general, and this isn't like they consciously think about it, everyone just kind of assumes this is the correct way to teach, that there is such a thing as a second language, and this is really what we have for a typical second language learning system. <clears throat> 
So we'll begin over here with the actual original language. I just call it the lesson, uh, but it could be vocabulary or phrase or some cultural thing, whatever that happens to be. Um, and for younger students, maybe it's just a simple word like a color or a shape or an animal name or something like that. Uh, and then all the way over here, we have the student. Now I call this second language learning again because people have an idea that there's such a thing as a second language and if there's a second language then you need to have a way of learning a second language. So you begin with the lesson. This is the original language over here, what's spoken on the streets or in movies and TV shows. And then as you move closer and closer to the student you have all these different steps that get added into the process that really start to complicate things and this is what creates all these problems up here. So the first thing, uh, the really, really the worst thing you can do if you're trying to help someone learn a language, uh, and again, there are these two ideas about learning. One is actually just learning some words, which is maybe you're traveling to a different country and you learn something like please or thank you, just so you can communicate in very basic ways. Uh, but then there's actual acquisition, where you're trying for fluency and you want to be able to communicate what you're using and what you're learning uh, without thinking about it. So again, there's these kind of two different ideas. And so this process here, uh, basically it's what I call something is very dangerous. I call this a very dangerous way of learning because it does teach the language. And people, when they go through this process, they do learn lots of words and phrases. The problem is that it doesn't really help them with fluency. And here's why. So you begin again with the lesson and then you move to the language where you're translating something already because most people are learning English, especially young children, uh, through their native language. So if I'm in Japan, uh, I go into a regular classroom with a Japanese teacher that's teaching English and most of the lesson, most of the actual information that's communicated to the student is all in Japanese. It's the same thing with the textbook. They have lots of Japanese written in the textbook. It's giving explanations about things. It's giving translations uh, and it's giving ways of pronouncing words through Japanese. So again, we're beginning with really the worst thing possible that you can do. Uh, for trying to help someone actually communicate in a second language. It's not bad for trying to teach something. I can communicate something. I can explain a rule to you. But often, just like the lessons that we learn in life, someone can tell us something just like I can tell my daughter, hey, don't touch the stove or you're going to burn yourself. And she says, okay, daddy, you know, she's not really paying attention. But when she actually touches the stove and burns herself, that's the real lesson. That's where the acquisition comes from. So again, this idea, we begin with the actual language and then slowly the language begins to shift. It begins to change. Uh, and so we have not really the actual English anymore, if we're talking about learning English. We begin to have like the Chinese version of that or the Japanese version or Portuguese or whatever the language is you're learning it in. Uh, next, we take that, what we're doing, we're translating something and then we also look at the formal vocabulary uh, of what people are learning in English for reading and writing. And this is mostly because people are taking tests and for, you know, whatever uh, academic tests or things like that that they need to go from uh, one level of schooling to another or to be able to get like, you know, pass a particular uh, exam to get a job or that kind of thing. So uh, we already have a limited vocabulary that's more of the formal language uh, than what you would hear again in an actual movie or TV show, something like that. Uh, again, we move into teaching the, the rules and the structure of the language actually by telling people what the rules are instead of helping people understand what the rules mean. And again, this is different. I'll explain a little bit more about how you should be doing this. Uh, but I just want to make these different steps clear. And also one more thing is that it's not really you do this thing and then this thing and then this thing. Uh, and some people maybe like you do try to have some other kind of vocabulary so you're missing one step or another. But this is generally how the process works. It's a couple of these things all together. Uh, and the point is really that we're separating the lesson, the real English, from the learner. So we move again from the grammar rules or whatever kinds of ideas we are. We're trying to have them learn uh, vocabulary by studying lists of things, trying to memorize them or use lots of flashcards. And then the, the final thing we have here is slowed speech. So this is where we take something like a listening practice exercise and we're listening to it. Uh, if I'm a student in a classroom here in Japan, I would listen. Oh, it's really very slow and very easy to understand, uh, kind of like the way I'm speaking now. So the way I speak in a lesson, like if I'm trying to teach things and I know non-native speakers will be listening to that, I'm communicating 
communicating in a different way than I would normally if I'm just talking to friends or family or even my daughter now. Um, but again, we're, we're going here and then by the time uh, the, the student actually touches the language, it's gone through all these filters. Basically, they're just filtering the language and changing it and trying to make it, it's, I, I know the, the idea is to make it easier for the, for the student to understand, but the problem is that we're making it more difficult for them to actually communicate. So here's basically the two big problems that we have from this. Uh, I've already explained that, uh, number one, the language is changing. So the original language here, if we translate it, we only teach the formal vocabulary. We try to take the rules and make them easier to understand, even though they actually become more difficult. Uh, like you can tell, I can tell you what a grammar rule is, but being able to use that grammar rule correctly and automatically, that's not really something you learn to do using this step. Uh, and then also the speech is much slower. Uh, so because the language changes, this makes it really, really difficult for learners who want to understand this. You're essentially separating the learner from the actual language they want to learn. And as the language changes, by the time it gets to them, when they have to go back into an actual speaking situation, so the person that's maybe learning, uh, like the Chinese learner that's learning English in a school, when they go out into the real world and try to communicate, they have to jump all the way back to this. This is the language that people are really speaking, but the language they learned is something that's basically completely different. And this is why so many people have a really hard time understanding native speakers, because the speech is faster, there are idioms and slang and other conversational vocabulary that you don't really learn, again, because you're getting the limited formal vocabulary for reading and writing. Uh, and then, again, because it's really slow, because of what you learned with the slow listening practice exercises, when everybody is really fast, uh, you get overwhelmed, there's too much information, and it makes it really difficult. Now, of course, uh, this is just for the learning phase of this. What's really difficult is when you have to try to reverse this process and go back when you actually want to speak. So this is just listening. If I'm just in a classroom, I don't even open my mouth. Someone is teaching me French or Spanish or Italian or whatever the language is, and they're using this typical second language learning system. Uh, I've learned the language. Okay, I understand something, but when I try to speak, what do I have to do? I have to re- I have to re, like, redo all of these steps. I have to work back all this. This is why people translate in their head and they get stuck thinking about grammar rules. Uh, they have to you know, really worry about their communication. They worry about making mistakes. How's my pronunciation? All of these things come because now they're trying to reverse these steps as they go back to try to communicate in the actual language. So what they do is they communicate in the language they've been taught, which is this really slow, uh, limited vocabulary, and they try to use grammar rules, but they aren't correct, and so that's why they end up sounding like robots when they speak. So if this is you, if you have this problem, again, it's, it's really all these different things here that come from this one idea. So I hope you understand this. This is incredibly important, and it's really the great language learning lie, that there's such a, such a thing as a second language. And I'll show you why that's not true in just a moment, but I really want you to understand this, is that if you uh, have been in this situation, maybe you are, are a teacher yourself or you've been a learner uh, and you experience all these problems. You have problems understanding and then you have, have, uh, have, excuse me, have actual problems communicating like I'm having right now. Uh, if you struggle with this, it's not your fault. The reason is because of this way of teaching, uh, but I'm going to explain right now that it doesn't have to be that way. So for Iman and for all the other teachers out there, uh, I know a lot of teachers follow me in what I do, so I really want to make my, my style of teaching the way uh, of showing people how something works so they understand it automatically and they can use it automatically. Uh, this is what you should be doing. So again, this is the, uh, the, the reason why people struggle to communicate and struggle to understand is because of all these steps. So you have the language changing, the language itself changes, like what you learn in a classroom is different from what's spoken in the streets. Uh, and then all these different steps, they essentially inhibit fluency, although they're actually helping you learn the language. So I might be able to sit down and take a test, but I can't really communicate in that language. And that's, again, the difference between learning something and actually acquiring the language, developing fluency, which is what my focus is. So I want to try to help people who have gone through this process and show them that there's a better way of doing it. Uh, but even more importantly, to take all the young students who have not even been exposed to, you know, a second language yet uh, and show them that there, there's actually a better way to do it, especially for learning English, because it's such an important thing. 
just to make this point uh, really clear, uh, just a few examples of this idea uh, of even just the language changing, but the different steps that you have here. Um, maybe you remember playing a game called Telephone when you were a young child. You would have uh, a group of kids either sitting down or standing in a line, and the first child would say something. They would whisper into the second child's ear, and then the next child, and they would pass that information on you know, to the next person, the next person, and the next person. And then by the end of that line, uh, again, you have this system here where the language is slowly changing, and it's changing in that same way. So this is a very natural thing that happens as a result of you just take something like this and continue to add more steps between uh, the sender of the message and the receiver of the message over here. And even if you're trying to be perfect, it's the same thing if I go to uh, like a copy place, I want to make photocopies of something. Uh, if I take a, an actual document, like a, a perfectly clean document, I make a copy of that document, uh, it's going to be not quite perfect. It'll look almost similar. You probably can't tell the difference. But if I keep making copies of copies of copies of copies, maybe by the 50th copy, uh, it could look like a completely different document. And again, it's because the more steps that you place between the sender and the receiver of a message, it's going to become uh Basically, you're going to lose. You're going to lose the message. It's going to change in some way, and so it's going to be more difficult when you try to go back to that step. Okay, so hopefully this makes sense. And this again, uh, what I call the great language learning lie is that there is such a thing as a second language. So we need a system like this that actually teaches languages. Uh, we need like okay, there's a, a second language learning system. Now, what I do, um, and here's why this, like, this belief is false, basically, that, that you don't really have to teach in this way because there's really no such thing as a second language. Uh, the idea is that it's really all in how we think about what a second language really is. And even learning something like mathematics uh, or, you know, biology or something like that, there's lots of different things like computer code where we're learning a different language, but you can understand what things mean without adding all these different steps into them. And it's the, the removal of these steps that's actually what, uh, what drives acquisition. So what actually helps you develop fluency is removing these steps and connecting the learner with, uh, with the lesson directly. So this is what I do, and I'll explain why uh, right now uh, the, this idea of a second language is just not really there. So first of all, uh, when you're learning your native language, everybody learns a native language, like even if you're maybe trapped in a box for many years and then you're you are released from that box and you, you are grown up maybe even from 20 years old in some kind of community, you will learn to speak the language of that community uh, naturally and without anybody having to tell you really grammar rules in a classroom, you will naturally develop an ability to understand the language. Uh, and that would be what people call your first language. So you don't need to learn uh, your first language through a different language. So that's just one example of how you can learn something directly from the very beginning without having something else again here like using a second language in order to try to learn you know, some other language like that. So there's no need for translating or anything like that when you're learning your first language. Now the same thing is also true for children like my daughter who are bilingual. So if they can speak two languages or you can even have children who speak more languages than that. Uh, and all those children are essentially learning the different languages, uh, but each one of them becomes a first language or a native language. Now, for most people, those two examples might seem like, okay, well, that's obvious, those are easy, but really the truth is that everyone uses multiple first languages without thinking about it. And just here are some very simple examples. So I could be speaking one way to my boss if I'm at some kind of work. I'm maybe uh, speaking a bit more formally. Uh, even right now, this is more of a like a work situation. I'm actually trying to make myself more clearly understood. So I'm communicating in a way that's easier for people to understand what I'm saying. But when I'm sitting with my friends, I communicate in a different way. Now, I actually have friends of mine, like maybe they're, uh, like one of their parents is from a different country. So I might be standing and speaking with one of them, and then they get a phone call from one of their parents. And as soon as they start speaking, they develop an accent. And their words and their vocabulary, even the way that they're speaking, changes. And even the way we speak when we're communicating with other people, maybe at our you know social level or someone higher, or we're communicating with young children, and that also changes. Now, each one of these different things is a different language, but we communicate in these things without even thinking about it. And so these are examples of where I'm thinking about something as not a second language, but really these are all just first languages because of how we learn them.
So really the difference between something like maybe me as, a, uh, as an English, a native English speaker from the United States, if I want to learn German, I can actually learn German uh, as a native person that's learning German as opposed to trying to use this system here to learn it as a second language. It just depends on the way I'm thinking about it. And so really the simple solution is to do this. You erase all of these different steps. And it's not that you don't teach grammar or you don't help people learn pronunciation or other things like that. It's more that you're making it really obvious and clear and easy for people to understand all those things by helping them connect directly with the language. And this is why I call it instant language learning. So the instant language learner is someone who can understand this directly without a teacher having to explain all these different things, without having to slow everything down, uh, without having to use translations or teach grammar rules specifically that will help them learn the language. Again, you'll learn vocabulary, you will remember things like that, but being able to connect everything and use it automatically the only way you get that is through being able to understand things automatically, and that's why I call it instant language learning. So the problem here, again, we have the great language learning lie that you have such a thing as a second language, but there really isn't one. It's more that there are two different ways of learning a language, and you can apply either of those to any language you want to learn. Now, the smart student, or especially the smart teacher, and especially for young children, is going to, going to use the instant language learning system. Now this is the way I teach, and again, I never really had a good name for it. It's just, how do I help people learn the language directly without me having to explain things or to do anything like that? And that's why you'll notice all the lessons that I have. Like I could teach you know, English in Japanese or something. I could have even a YouTube channel like that where I focus just specifically on helping uh, Japanese speakers. But the reason I don't is because if I were to do that, I would help them learn a lot, but I'm not going to help them communicate as well as if I'm able to teach like this. So the number one thing you should be doing as a teacher is everything should be taught in the language. And if you have to explain something in your native language, it means that it's too complicated for them. You need to take it down, make it much easier for people to understand so that they can connect directly with the language. Now you can slow it down a little bit the same way that we help teach uh, you know, young children, even for my daughter, when I began teaching her, uh, when she was, you know, I mean, obviously right from birth, I began speaking to her, but as she gets older, uh, now I speak much more quickly to her and she can understand what I'm saying. And she even herself, she uses wanna and gonna and other things like that, that I specifically taught her how to do, because again, I'm, I'm giving this same thing of just teaching one thing at a time, making it easy. I'm not having to translate anything. I'm just showing her things and letting her mind do the work automatically that it should be doing. Basically, we make things really difficult for the mind because we're trying to teach the language the same way a computer might learn it, when we don't learn that way. We learn by connecting with things and understanding them, and this is why we enjoy puzzles. We get a little bit of information, we get a clue about something, and then we see how we can put that together and really make it uh, very obvious and easy to understand uh, for our minds. So again, that's why the belief is false. Uh, you don't have to teach it. There really is no such thing as a second language. And right now, I'm just going to make a very simple lesson using Japanese to help you learn Japanese. But again, I'm not going to use any English in this, but it's going to be very simple, very easy. And if you already speak Japanese, then maybe this will be not the greatest example for you. Uh, I have an actual a presentation here on YouTube. If you go to the channel, you should be able to find... Uh, I forget the name of it now, but it's, it's basically a presentation where I'm talking about how you should learn a second language. Uh, and I give uh, an example of language learning as an alien would do it. So when I think about how do I teach something, especially for the new app that we're developing or any of the lessons that I develop, I try to think how could an alien understand this? And obviously that's really for very beginners, which I'm kind of doing, but you can use instant language learning for every level. It's just that you're trying to think about how do I make something understandable as quickly as possible without any steps in between the learner and the lesson? So very quickly, uh, just like a quick uh, Japanese lesson, so I'll teach you some Japanese, and I'm going to be very slow because maybe this is like a new thing, just like you're a young child learning it, but I'm not going to use any English, and I just want you to relax and just look at these pictures up here, and hopefully we come up with something fun to do while we're, while we're looking at this. And hopefully your mind should begin working, and we'll see. If I've taught you correctly, you should kind of have the answer or be able to make, you know, other interesting things uh, with the language. But you should be able to understand it without me telling you what things are in your language. 
So let's just look at some things over here. Shikaku. 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 Maru. Maru. Sankaku. Shikaku. Sankaku. Ich ni san. Ich ni san shi. Shikaku. Maru. Sankaku. Aoi. Aoi shikaku. Aoi shikaku. Akai shikaku. Akai shikaku. 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 Shiroi shikaku. Shiroi maru. Shiroi sankaku. Aoi. Aoi shikaku. Akai shikaku. Neko. Shiroi neko. Shiroi neko. Shikaku. Aoi shikaku. Akai shikaku. Shiroi neko. Shiroi neko. Akai shikaku. Akai neko. Akai neko. Hato. Hato. Akai shikaku. Akai neko. Hato. Akai hato. Okay, now that was pretty simple. I'm basically just explaining some different things and here's why I did it the way I did it. Now, first, if I just draw something, uh, like just looking at one thing by itself, it's really difficult for the mind to understand what exactly the person is talking about. And this is why we always begin when we're teaching something uh, by contrasting it with something else. So we wanna, we wanna have a contrast. I'm putting some other things with this here. Okay, so this group of things, you already understand that these are shapes. So I don't need to explain, I'm not trying to say like the word shape, uh, but putting them all together and showing, okay, they, there's, they look similar, they're in a group together, but I can talk about them and try to explain what these different things are. So shikaku is square, uh, maru is circle, and sankaku is a triangle. And so if I went back and if you listen carefully, you heard like shikaku, so shi meaning four. So it's got four angles, shikaku, Maru and Sankaku, so each ni san, Sankaku, so there are three, uh, three angles in a triangle. So just the same way it is in English, a triangle is a Sankaku, Sankaku. Uh, so we have uh, here the same thing, we have a blue square and we have a red square. So I'm taking the same thing where you've learned that the name of the shape is a square uh, and then you learned, okay, the color of it here we have uh, like a blue square and a red square. So you're learning again, like the color of something, what's different between these, in these examples, uh, blue square and red square. So aoi, so ao is blue and aka is uh, red, but the adjective there, we're, we're putting that on something else. So aka becomes akai, like akai shikaku. Uh, or we have uh, uh, like a blue, like aoi uh, shikaku here. So a blue square, uh, or a red square. And then the same thing over here, I can begin by just going back with the color or I can talk about the animal. You already know what the animal is, but I can teach you the name of it in Japanese and make it more of a puzzle for your brain to understand automatically. And it's that idea, this is why we like doing puzzles because our brain wants to understand that and so if you allow your brain to understand these things, uh, you automatically develop that fluency and you, you want to understand something, you feel excited about that. And if you understood this, ah, uh, like shido meaning white. Now this is a little bit tricky because like this has a black outline, but white on the inside. But um, so white, 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 uh, like an even better lesson would have been to make these green or something like that, uh, just to make it even more obvious that that's what I'm talking about. But the general idea is the same where we're trying to communicate something in the language of origin and in the way that you should be learning it, uh, the same way a child would be learning it. So there's no such thing as a second language, it's just more that people are using a system called second language learning because they think there's such a thing as a second language. Now, technically or realistically, you could learn any language you 
want using this same system. It's just that basically 99% of people don't offer any system like this because they believe this idea that there's such a thing as a second language. And so we need to have second language learning in order to understand something like that. So this is the tricky thing uh, about learning and the reason that people have uh, so much trouble. All of these different things up here is again because they believe there's such an idea as a second language. Uh, so this is learners and teachers and people assume really there's no way to, to understand the language uh, without having to do something like teach it through your native language or go through rules and steps. But you see here uh, just a very easy example of me doing something in Japanese where I don't need to explain something. Uh, but I can just by teaching you what the things are and making sure I don't give you more information that you can understand, your brain wants to understand that, it's eager, and then because you understand things, you get more excited about speaking. So you see how that works? This is instant language learning, and this is what you should be doing, Iman or other people who are watching this as teachers, if you want to communicate or have, um, have students that not only enjoy the language, uh, but also you know, really, really get excited about wanting to speak. So it's like a puzzle uh, and people enjoy puzzles because again, the mind, the mind likes to be given some information and then we try to, we try to fit in like what, what we think that other thing would be. So if I have like, uh, like a white, a white cat here, if I, if we know this is like a white square uh, and like a white cat, and then we have a red square and then something cat your mind will begin to make that connection between, okay, like I, I understand how adjectives work. So really now you understand even basic adjective use uh, in Japanese by just taking something like colors and shapes uh, or colors and objects and then putting them together in a way that you understand them instantly rather than trying to understand them through another language. Does this make sense? Uh, please let me know in the comments down below if you understood this because this is such an important idea for me. It's everything I do, uh, like for the fluency course, which you can learn more about by clicking on the link in the upper right of this video. Uh, everything about that is helping people learn like the grammar, the idioms, all of that stuff, but natively uh, the instant way. So we take things and try to show you what something is like a grammar example would be phrasal verbs. Uh, I show you examples like if I, if I have my, like my hand or something like this, or even I take this eraser here, I get a little bit closer to the camera. So I'm holding the eraser here, and instead of trying to give you a translation, I can show you something uh, while I'm giving you an example of this. So I can turn the eraser around, like turn around, or I can turn it over. Now these are two very simple phrasal verbs, turn around and turn over, but seeing it like that, oh, okay, turn over means to move something upside down or put something that's on top on bottom like that. So turn over or turn around, very easy. So I don't have to give you a long list of things. I don't have to explain lots of grammar. It's more showing you something in a way that you understand it. And because you understand it instantly, you're able to communicate it instantly as well. Well, uh, that's enough uh, for this. Hopefully uh, we'll kind of see where this goes. If you have more questions, uh, do put them down in the comments below this video. Like and share this video if you'd like to learn more about this. But really, this is the essence of what I do. And if you're a teacher as well, you should be doing the same thing. We'll be explaining more about this uh, as we release uh, Frederick very soon. So this is our new app for really the ultimate guide to pronunciation as well as for uh, beginners who have not learned English at all. If you want to give this guide to your, uh, this app to your child the same way my daughter uses it who started using it when she was about one year old and now she's reading uh, letters and starting to pronounce things very well and she really enjoys playing with it. Uh, but we'll be releasing that soon. And the whole idea of that app is helping people connect with the language directly. So for absolute beginners, for children who want to learn the language, maybe you as a parent or a teacher, you had to learn it the, the second language way, but you don't have to do that to your children. And so that's why taking these ideas of instant language learning, uh, we've created that app. The same thing with the visual guide to phrasal verbs, which you can also learn about on our website. Uh, it takes these ideas, the same thing of like turn around and turn over, just showing you things visually so you understand how that works, both with video examples and also me, you know, moving things around like that. So language learning doesn't have to be difficult. In fact, it can be very fun and your mind really understands uh, and likes learning that way if you just allow the brain to learn instantly. Well, that's it for this lesson. Again, do leave a comment down below. Uh, let me know if you enjoyed this, if it was uh, helpful for you. Uh, and if you know other people who do struggle and you want to explain the same thing to them, hopefully they enjoy this video as well if you share it with them. Have a fantastic day and I'll see you in the next video. Bye-bye.